So hello, welcome. Welcome to episode six of my Beyond the Titanic series. And today I find myself in a tiny little town in the north of England, a town that to the average passer through looks like any other. However, within this town lies this little hotel just behind me here. And in this hotel, there lies a little gem or rather a Titanic sized gem. Yes, within its walls, it holds a massive link to the Titanic, one that could be found probably nowhere else in the entire world. And I know I say this in nearly every single video, but I'm rather excited about this one because it's the first time I'm actually seeing it for myself. I've booked myself a room here, but before we check in, our journey doesn't actually begin here today. It begins about 200 miles in that direction. So come with me as we explore the fascinating story of Titanic's older sister ship and queen of the Olympic class fleet, RMS Olympic. She was the largest ship of her time a technological marvel. Sending shockwaves around the globe, her maiden voyage would be her last. Just four days into her first crossing, RMS Titanic sank in the North Atlantic, taking 1,500 lives with her. These are the stories of those who witnessed firsthand one of the greatest maritime disasters in peacetime history. The Olympic of the Southampton, the old White Star Liner, is sailing on her last voyage. Scientists of a joint US-French expedition said today they have found wreckage of the ocean liner whose name is a legend, the SS Titanic. So welcome, welcome back to Belfast. This is where we actually begin today. That's right, I've flown all the way over here for this segment of the video. That's how dedicated I am to this channel. They also do really good caramel shortcakes at the local market. So uh, two birds and one stone and all that. Now, for those of you who have watched my videos before, you would have heard me talk about the Olympic on many different occasions. But for those of you who are new here, welcome. Here's a quick rundown of what we're actually be talking about today. The Titanic. Everyone knows her name, but many, non-Titanic buffs or the average person who's not obsessed like me doesn't realize that she's actually a twin, a copy of a basic plan. Well, technically she's actually one of three. You see, the Titanic was part of a fleet of ships known as the Olympic class liners. These near enough identical superliners were designed as direct competition to rival Cunard. Now White Star was known more for luxury and grandeur rather than speed. So rather than focusing on obtaining a faster Atlantic crossing, they instead focused on providing a more comfortable crossing for all classes. The new vessels would be the largest, grandest and safest ships ever to take to the waves. And if that wasn't enough, instead of building just two vessels, which was the normal custom, they would again go one step further and build three. Yes, White Star were expecting triplets. These three vessels would be called the Olympic, the Titanic, and the Britannic. Now the Olympic, the vessel that we are focusing on today was built here on this very spot and I'm standing on slipway number two of the old Honorable shipyard right here in Belfast. Now construction on the Olympic began on December 16th, 1908. And although the Titanic and the Olympic were built side by side, the Titanic just over there, the Olympic here, construction did not start on Titanic until three months after work had commenced on the Olympic because this allowed for less pressure on the workers of the shipyard. Now to accommodate the giant liners, Highland Wolf had to completely redesign this entire area and consolidated several smaller slipways into two giant ones. And although they were the biggest slipways the shipyard had now ever seen, there was still not enough room for them to build all three Olympic class ships side by side. Now to build this ship, Highland Wolf constructed a giant scaffolding that sat over this entire area. It was known as the Aral Gantry. It stood 230 feet high and dominated Belfast skyline. Now it took just shy of two years for Olympics Hole to be constructed, but finally on October 20th, 1910, she was ready to be launched for a construction slipway into these waters. Now at 10.50 a.m. two rockets were sent up into the air and then another one just before 11 to signify that launch was imminent and to warn any water traffic here to clear the area. Now if you were a worker at the shipyard, you weren't guaranteed time off to watch the launch, even if you had worked on the Olympic. You could request it however, but if permission was granted it would come at a cost, as your wages would be docked for the privilege. 
To assist with the launch, Olympic's slipway here was coated in 15 tonnes of tallow, five tonnes of train oil, and three tonnes of soap. One can only imagine the smell of that bizarre concoction. I don't think I'd even want to watch the slipway if I was a worker here. Not only do I have to pay for the privilege, but I was also getting covered in 15 tonnes of tallow. At 11 a.m. the ship was released and the giant Olympic began her journey here from construction slipway into the waters of Belfast. It took roughly 62 seconds and she reached a top speed of 14 miles an hour. Once in the water, three giant anchor chains and 80 tons of cabling brought the ship to a stop. After two years under construction, the mighty Olympic, the largest ship ever built, was finally born. However, she was nothing more than an empty shell at this point. To be converted into a luxury ship that she was to become, that would need to be completed at the dry dock, which is at the other end of the shipyard, which we're now going to take a look at. This is actual footage of Olympic's launch. You may notice here that her hull is actually painted a light grey. White Star never actually christened their ships in the traditional sense. Instead, it was common practice to paint the first ship of the class in a light grey shade to make her stand out more in press photographs. Titanic never received this privilege and no footage of her launch exists today. So I've come to the Thompson Dry Dock and Pump House and this is where the Olympic would have been brought to during her fitting out process, the process in which she was converted into a transatlantic liner. Now unfortunately I've hit a bit of a problem because my original intention was to take you down into the dry dock to have a look around like I have done on previous visits here to Belfast. Unfortunately though I can't today because I don't like whiskey and if you're scratching your head wondering what whiskey has to do with the Olympic well the pump house here has been converted into a distillery and the only way I can get down there is if I purchase a guided tour around the distillery and then they take you down into the dry dock so unfortunately we're just going to have to make do with a voiceover at this part. I mean it really does annoy me why convert it into a distillery? In my, you know you might as well have a water park here slides playground ball pit so moving on from my obvious annoyance there, Olympic was moved into the dry dock on April 1st, 1911 to complete her fitting out process. So how did the dry dock work? Now the dock is simply a giant Olympic class footprint sitting below water level. The door here known as the case and gate was sealed after the ship entered the dock and was the only thing keeping back the millions of gallons of water. Once the dock was sealed, the pump house set about draining the dock which took around 90 minutes. As the dock was drained, the ship would rest upon these blocks here, which are original. Here's an example of what it actually looked like. This is the Nomadic, resting upon the blocks in her dry dock, just up the road from here. The dock was built purely for the Olympic class vessels, and so there was only a few feet to spare once the ship was actually in the dock. The workers of the shipyard would gain access to the dock by an entrance on either side, consisting of a steep stone stairway and an accompanying slope. What's the purpose of the slope, I hear you ask? No, it's not for workers to slide down on their brake as someone once suggested to me. It was actually used to move heavy tools and equipment up and down into the dock. Before the pump house was taken over by the distillery, it really was an amazing place to visit. You had free roam to look about for yourself, see and touch history. The original blocks that the Olympic and the Titanic rested on, the case and gate, which is original, it gave you an incredible feeling to essentially be standing in Titanic's footprint and it's just such a shame that you can no longer do that. You can still go down there but you have to be taken by a tour guide which I just think is a real shame. Once in the dry dock Olympic had her propellers fitted as seen here in this now famous image that actually often gets labelled as Titanic. It's not. In fact many of the images you see of Titanic are actually of Olympic as she was photographed more thoroughly than that of her sister. Again it boils down to the fact that photographers were less enthusiastic by the time Titanic came along. So were the two sisters identical? The answer to that is both yes and no. To the casual observer they seem pretty much the same. Take a look at this image of the two sisters side by side. Can you tell them apart? They look quite similar right? It's true. The Olympic class ships were designed off the same basic plan, but to those who have studied the ships in depth, the differences are obvious and any Titanic buff will have no problem in telling them apart. When the Olympic completed her maiden voyage, Titanic was still under construction. Observations were made on Olympic's performance, 
notes were taken down, and any improvements or adjustments were made on Titanic, thus making both ships unique in their own right. I'm not going to go into all the differences right now because there are just too many, but the easiest way to tell them apart is to look at the A-deck promenade. On Olympic, it's open the full length of the deck. On Titanic, it's partially closed. A few months later the Olympic was ready and on June 14th 1911, captained by Edward John Smith, the future captain of Titanic, she departed Southampton on her maiden voyage. The press was out in force to capture the event, the largest, safest and most luxurious ship ever to be crafted by man was on her way. The hype around the Olympic was incredible, far far greater than it would be for Titanic the following year and the world lapped it up. When she arrived in New York she was opened up for public viewing and over 8,000 people stepped aboard just to take a look around. Another 10,000 spectators watched as she left New York on her first return crossing. It's safe to say that the Olympic was a success, however fate would soon intervene. On September 20th 1911 on her fifth crossing and again captained by Edward John Smith, disaster struck. After departing Southampton, the Olympic was sailing parallel to the British cruiser HMS Hawk. The Olympic then made an unexpected wide turn to starboard which caught the Hawk off guard. The reinforced bow of the Hawk was sucked in by Olympic's giant wake, and despite best efforts, Hawk's bow slammed into Olympic's stern starboard side, tearing two massive holes, one above and one below her waterline. Two of her watertight compartments were flooded and her propeller shaft was badly damaged. Remarkably, however, no one was killed. The Olympic, now badly damaged, abandoned the voyage and limped back to port. The Royal Navy blamed the Olympic for the collision, claiming that her size generated a large amount of suction that pulled the hawk in. White Star, of course, argued against this. A legal battle ensued, which eventually concluded that the Olympic was indeed to blame. This was a financial disaster for White Star, as they were slapped with a large legal bill, not to mention the cost of repairs and the lost revenue while she was out of service. The collision, however, had a bit of a silver lining. The fact that she was able to stay afloat after such a serious collision impressed the paying public and her builders and reinforced the unsinkable reputation of the Olympic class fleet. It took about two weeks of repairs in Southampton before the Olympic was able to return to Belfast for a more permanent solution, which took another six weeks to be completed. Now to get the Olympic back into service as quickly as possible, resources were pulled from the Titanic, which was still under construction in Belfast. The Olympic returned to service in November of 1911. However, in February of 1912, she would again suffer another setback, losing a propeller blade on an eastbound crossing, which again, forced her to return to Belfast for repair. Now these two incidences would have tragic consequences. Originally Titanic was due to set sail on her maiden voyage on March 20th 1912, but the repairs on Olympic had slowed down progress on Titanic. Her builders quickly concluded that she simply would not be ready in time. White Star then decided to push her maiden voyage back to April 10th of 1912. Just think, if the Hawk incident had never have taken place, Olympic would never have needed those repairs. Titanic would have likely sailed on her original March 20th date and she'd in all probability become nothing more than a simple footnote in the history books. Weird isn't it how a single event can have such a drastic impact on a timeline. The Olympic had a very long and successful career at sea and I wish I could include everything in this video. However, it would end up being about two hours long and I'd have to go all Hollywood on you and end up doing it in two parts, which I don't really want to do. So here is a quick but relevant look at Olympic's career at sea. On April 15th, 1912, the world awoke to the news that Titanic had sunk on her maiden voyage. Olympic had received her sister's distress call, but was simply too far away to provide any sort of assistance. The loss of Titanic would have immediate effects for not just the Olympic, but every vessel at sea. One of the main issues that arose from Titanic was the complete lack of lifeboats for all aboard, and now every ship afloat was in a desperate scramble to equip themselves with more boats. Olympic was not immune to this, and just weeks after the sinking, 284 of the ship's firemen went on strike over concerns that her new boats, which were secondhand and rotten, were not actually seaworthy. In October of 1912, following the loss of Titanic, 
Olympic was removed from service for a refit. This included increasing her lifeboat capacity from her initial 20 to 68. An inner watertight skin was constructed in her engine and boiler rooms, which created a double hull. Five of her watertight bulkheads were extended up to B deck. It now meant that the Olympic would likely survive a collision similar to that that sank Titanic. On August 4, 1914, Britain entered the First World War and initially the Olympic remained in commercial service. However, the threat of German boats to commercial shipping meant that passenger numbers quickly dropped and as a result of this, White Star decided to remove her and many other ships from service. On October 21st of the same year, Olympic left New York on her last commercial crossing for the time being, carrying only 153 passengers. White Star initially had plans to lay the Olympic up in Belfast until the war was over, however in May of 1915 she was called upon for service as a troop transport vessel. She was therefore quickly repainted in camouflage colours and hastily converted into a wartime vessel. This included arming her with guns on her deck. In the early hours of May 12th 1918 whilst en route to France, the Olympic sighted a surface U-boat but instead of fleeing, the Olympic went on the attack. Her gunners immediately opened fire and she set about directly towards the enemy. The crew of the U-boat hastily prepared to launch torpedoes from their stern, but was unable to flood their torpedo tubes before they were spotted. The U-boat then started to crash dive in an attempt to turn parallel to the Olympic, but unfortunately for them, there was simply not enough time. Olympic's giant port propeller slashed through the hull of the sub, sinking her. Nine crew of the U-boat lost their lives and Olympic didn't even stop to pick up survivors. This action earned the Olympic the title of being the only commercial vessel to sink an enemy sub throughout the entire war. During the conflict, the Olympic is reported to have carried up to 200,000 troops and other personnel, burning around 347,000 tonnes of coal and travelling about 184,000 miles. Olympic's war service earned her the nickname of Old Reliable, which would stick for the rest of her career at sea. After the war, the Olympic returned to Belfast in 1919 for restoration back into a civilian vessel, where she was converted to burn oil rather than coal. A large dent below her waterline with a crack was also discovered, and it was later concluded that she had been struck by a torpedo at some point which had failed to detonate. She returned to service on the 25th of June 1920. Throughout the entire 20s, she carried some of the most powerful people of the era, including Marie Curie, Charlie Chaplin, and the uncle to our late Queen, Prince Edward, the then Prince of Wales and later King. The Olympic proved popular with all classes as White Star continued to evolve with the times, adding more private bathrooms to cabins and even adding a dance floor. By 1929, the Olympic experienced her highest average passenger numbers to date. The future for Olympics seemed bright. However, as the old saying goes, what goes up must come down. The Great Depression of 1929 had a massive impact on shipping and by the early 1930s passenger numbers had halved. At around the same time passengers had begun to favour newer, faster ships with more up-to-date facilities. So in 1932 the Olympic underwent a four-month refit in a bid to try and encourage passengers back. Once her refit was completed her owners described her as looking like new. However, despite this, passenger numbers failed to recover, and for the first time in her career between 1933 and 34, she operated at a net loss. At this point, she was now over 20 years old, and things were not looking so good for the old reliable. With the question of her future hanging over her, Olympic continued to try and regain her popularity. However, in 1934, another mishap would help seal her fate. Within a few miles of the American coast, the Olympic, sailing in a dense fog on a course set by the directional radio of the Nantucket, rammed the lightship which sunk in 30 seconds. On May 15th, the Olympic was on approach to New York in heavy fog and was using the radio signal of the smaller Nantucket lightship as a guide. As the Olympic approached, she failed to spot the smaller vessel in time and sliced her in half, sinking her. Of her 11 crew members, seven were killed in the incident. The Great Depression would prove to be the end of the White Star Line. In great financial difficulty, it was forced to merge with its rival company Cunard to access financial assistance from the British government. 
The merger took place on May 10th, 1934. Sadly, however, for the Olympic, it would prove to be the final nail in her coffin. On April 5th, 1935, the Olympic departed New York for the final time. And upon her return to Southampton, she was permanently withdrawn from service. After over 20 years at sea, traveling around 1.8 million miles and carrying about 430,000 paying passengers, well, the sun had finally set on Olympic's career. The sister to the Titanic and the only surviving member of the Olympic class fleet, well, her time was done and she was sent to the scrapyard to be broken up and dismantled. But that doesn't mean the Olympic disappeared forever. There are still remnants of the great ship dotted about all over the globe. One just has to know where to look. And that, my friends, takes us back to our original location in today's episode. Team up for the last time. The Olympic is at Southampton, her decks empty. And for the last time, the Blue Peter flutters from her masthead. The old White Star liner is sailing on her last voyage, en route for Jarrow and the shipbreakers. But there is no send-off. They called her the Old Reliable. Now her days are done, and away she goes, reliable to the last. So, what makes this hotel behind me here so significant? Well, this is the White Swan Hotel in Annick, just north of Newcastle. And when the Olympic was decommissioned and broken down, many of her fixtures and fittings were sold at public auction. And the owner of the hotel at the time, who was a frequent traveller on board the Olympic, attended the auction and purchased a thing or two. So, we're going to check in and take a look around. Unfortunately though, I have a bit of a problem. When I emailed ahead and said, look guys, I'm coming to your hotel, what are the chances of me just doing a bit of recording? I won't get in the way, I won't disturb anyone. Helpfully, they responded and said no. So, shall we go in and do a bit of covert recording anyway? Yes, let's. Now, before we even enter the hotel, when I said earlier that they purchased a thing or two, I may have downplayed it a little bit because as soon as you get here, the entrance to this hotel, the revolving door I'm about to go to, was once the entrance to Olympic's first class restaurant. What makes things even more crazy is it's just one of the smallest elements that this hotel actually has. Things get way bigger as we go inside. Now, you've probably noticed the next thing I'm gonna show you, and it's this section here, this hand rail or banister, whatever you wanna call it. This section, again, is from the Olympic. And if it looks familiar, it should, because it's from Olympic's aft grand staircase. And of course, the staircase was made world famous because of James Cameron's 1997 blockbuster, Titanic. And we're whispering because we don't wanna get caught because reception is just down there. Now, when you enter this room, it's like you've stepped onto the set of a film, but make no mistake, none of this is a recreation. All of the wooden panelling you see here, the ceiling, the support beams, the stained glass window, and even the mirror are all from the Olympic. Yes, essentially, this is Olympic's first class lounge. And when the ship was decommissioned, it was removed piece by piece, transported here and reinstalled into this hotel. What makes it even more amazing is that it is near enough identical to that of the Titanic's. The materials would have come from the same source and the hands that built this room would also have worked on the Titanic. And it is incredible to be seeing all this for the first time. In all my years of being into Titanic, this is probably the closest I or anyone could ever come to actually boarding the ship itself. Now, on Titanic, her first class lounge was located midship and was either destroyed during the breakup or when the bow section hit the seabed. But coming back to Olympic, this is the largest intact section, original section of the ship that can be found anywhere in the entire planet and is a fitting tribute to one of the greatest ocean liners ever to take to the sea and the last remaining vessel of the Olympic class fleet. So we're coming to an end of this episode and my stay at the White Swan in Annick, and I wish I could praise this hotel. Unfortunately, they made my time recording here far, far more difficult than it had to be with their unwillingness to let me freely record. It makes me wonder that if they're that troubled about Titanic enthusiasts coming in, why make such a fuss about their links to Titanic in the first place? The actual hotel itself is average at best. The breakfast wasn't that great. And at £200 a night, it's a bit steep for what it is. So my advice would be to stay at the Premier Inn about a five minute drive away, wander in, take a look around, 
and save your money. So I just want to end today's episode quickly with this. Do you remember earlier how I said that the Olympic was sold at auction, everything was sold? Well, that really did mean everything from her first class lounge, as you've just seen, down to her smaller items like her cutlery, everything had to go. And a lot of it fell into private commercial usage, into warehouses, into a paint factory and stuff like that. But as time goes on, as Titanic has become more popular, these items have been sought after by collectors, including the likes of myself. And over the years, a few of these items have found their way to me, which I just want to show you quickly, including this. This is a deck plank from the Olympic. No idea which part of the ship it comes from. It could have come from the bridge. It could have come from a toilet. I have absolutely no idea. A more recent thing I want to show you that's come into my collection is this. And this is a floor tile, again, recovered from the Olympic. And again, no idea where it actually comes from. From my, my research though, I believe it to be a second class area, but to pinpoint its exact location, near enough impossible. As time goes on, items like these become more expensive. The tile, which I bought singly and had framed altogether, cost me about £600. The plank, the deck plank, cost me about £200 with auction fees and VAT. Crazy, some might say. An investment, others might say. So, thank you for watching today's episode. Um, longer than I anticipated it to be, and even longer with this little bit here, but I felt I had to add it in. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. I've helped, I hope you found it informative like always, and hopefully I shall see you again on the next episode. So until then, thanks for watching. Goodbye. Okay, okay we're going. Yeah. I'm about to go through is from the Olympic. It was once Olympic's restaurant to her end. <laughs> The only surviving member of the what of the oh.